selection of a site for the first television station presented many difficulties of which the public know little. Eventually, the Alexandra Palace was chosen. This playground of northeast London was a relic of Victorian times. It is, as you see, decorated in the style of the period and stands in a park of almost 200 acres, 350 feet above sea level, commanding a wonderful view over London. It has been used for many years past as a setting for concerts, exhibitions and circuses. November 1935, the work of reconstruction was begun on the southeast wing. To convert the old palace into the headquarters of the latest miracle in electrical communication, complete reconstruction was necessary, so that the building might house the transmitters, control rooms, studios, and all the complicated apparatus of the two television systems. The basement had to be cleared, rafters had to be dismantled, walls had to be demolished. Girders were cut away, and some of these old cast iron girders were very tough. It took hours to cut them through. A modern steel girder of this size could be severed in about 10 minutes. They built solidly in the Victorian days. It took many hours of careful work to lower these great heavy beams to ground level and run them out onto the main terrace in front of the palace. From there, they were hoisted into lorries and taken away. When the old shell had been gutted, nothing much beyond the main walls and floors were left. The plans for reconstruction had, of course, been made long beforehand, and while demolition was still going on in one part of the building, the concrete mixers were already preparing the new cement foundations for another. ground floor had to be made solid enough to bed heavy generators and rotary converters which are part of the transmitting equipment. In the bed transmitting hall alone there are 12 heavy motor generators. Meanwhile new walls grew up and old ones were made good and plastered. The foundations were excavated to carry the water supply necessary to cool the transmitter valves and to make room for the modern drainage necessary for dressing rooms and bathrooms. Ceilings were replastered. Part of the balcony on the main facade was enclosed to make room for additional apparatus. The southeast tower itself was gutted and completely redesigned to hold five floors of modern offices. For weeks, the bricks were being hoisted up the tower and gradually this part of the work began to take shape. At last they were complete and the bricklayers pointed the exterior walls to make them proof against the weather. It was at about this time that Vladimir Zvorikin, originator of the television camera, visited the director of television at Alexandra Palace. Mr. John Logie Baird is well known as the pioneer of British television. Here is some of the Baird apparatus. The transmitting valves, the spotlight scanner, the spotlight studio in which photo cells take the place of lights and the telecine projection room with the projector in course of erection. The 
the film is here being threaded from the magazine and down through the gate. The cathode ray tubes being packed and baked under covers to guard those doing the work against implosion. Meanwhile, at the Marconi EMI factory at Hayes, the glass flasks, which form the basis of the Emitron camera, are being assembled. An opening at one end of the tube is gradually enlarged with a carbon rod so that a further glass tube can be joined on. The mosaic inside the tube, when scanned by a cathode ray, transforms the optical image thrown upon it into a series of electrical impulses. The flask, with various projections upon it, each carrying an electrical connection, is joined up to a mercury vacuum pump for exhaustion. Gases remaining in the metal parts being driven out by heat. The complete tube is then mounted above its own amplifier, which forms the base of the electron camera. The hood carrying the optical lens is placed in position. This lens racks forward for focus so that the complete emitron can be used like a cinema camera. Here in the experimental studios at Hayes, emitron cameras are being tested. In one studio, a close-up is being taken of one of the members of the staff. and her picture comes up on the television monitor. Meanwhile, the coaxial cable is being tested by the post office engineers. This coaxial cable is destined to carry television from the heart of London up to the transmitter. The cable is hauled through ducts at Alexandra Palace and greased to make it slide more easily down the manholes and through the pipes which carry it. Length by length it is pulled through. The generators we spoke of earlier are here seen mounted on their concrete beds. The leads are being joined up from the mains. A motor is fitted and installed. and preparations for the mast proceed. Here is the great winch which hauls the girders up to the roof of the building from where they are hoisted one by one to take their places in the orderly erection of the mast.
station is now complete and working. The director of television in his office. The restaurant crowded with staff. The indicators functioning. The switchboards installed and the valves in position. Up in the makeup room, Mary Allen is making up Elizabeth Cowell, one of the three television announcers. boy arrives, the program is about to begin. The announcer crosses to the studio to announce Adele Dixon. Engineers stand by in the control room. The levels are set. Switches are thrown. Generators begin to turn. The water flows through to the transmitter valves. The valve filaments begin to glow. The lights in the studios come up on the dimmers. The producer is waiting at his microphone to speak his last word to the artist. The controllers are ready on vision and sound. The vision and sound are on. The station goes on the air. A mighty maze of mystic magic rays is all about us in the blue. And in sight and sound they trace living pictures Having shown you some of the many aspects of television and its programs, which incidentally are transmitted over an area of at least 2,000 square miles, we end this brief survey of the early progress and establishment of British television with an introduction to Hyam Greenbaum conducting the first television orchestra which has accompanied this film. <laughs>